Paul, take it away. Right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending and uh, listening to the story on Faraday Copper, where we're developing U.S. copper resources. The customary uh, cautionary statement. And so what do we have? We have one of the largest undeveloped copper resources in the U.S., still in the hands of a junior. There are 4.2 billion pounds of copper in the M&I category. Um, we delivered a PEA a few months ago now. That's really... The base case uh, demonstrates a robust project and forms a foundation for our strategy, which is about continuing to grow the resource, uh, targeting new discoveries with a lot of untested targets in the district, and value engineering. Our PEA was seeing a, a base case of 30,000 tons per day and 50,000 tons of copper production for 30 years. We're targeting an increase up to 45,000 tons per day uh, production and 75 thousand tons of annual production. Uh, we're also seeing um, we've got a gold program. Um, previously gold wasn't captured in the mineral resource. Uh, certain phases of the mineralization are enriched in gold and we see that as a value add in byproducts as well. In terms of catalysts coming up in the next month we've got a 20,000 meter diamond drill program uh, underway. As I mentioned the gold project and then the ongoing technical studies looking at that increase in production. So when we look at the universe of copper projects uh, in the Americas, particularly in the hands of the juniors, then Faraday stands out well amongst our peers, particularly in terms of our low initial capital. We're talking about eight, just shy of $800 million to get the open pit and mill up and running, um, and then a 30-year mine life. And then conversely, you know, we're still undervalued to our peers when you look at our, our resources. In terms of our corporate overview, we're well cashed up. We've got over $20 million in the bank. That will uh, see us deliver on our key milestones over the next 12 months. Um, importantly, we've got three key strategic shareholders in the Lundin family, who collectively have about 19% of Faraday, uh, Murray Edwards, another Canadian resource billionaire at 65 and Pierre Lassande at almost 4%. Um, we've recently had uh, new analyst coverage from Stiefel and TD. And even in this difficult market, you know, we've uh, outperformed our, our peers and, and the general market for, for junior coppers. So where do we locate? We're right in the heart of the southern Arizona, in the heart of the copper belt there. We're at the confluence of two main trends, a nor um, east, northeast, and a northwest. Where we've got, obviously, Arizona great infrastructure, roads, rail, power. Importantly, we're not in any residential footprint. Um, and there's no native uh, Indian title over the project uh, and no national forest. We've got a large land package that was augmented earlier this year, and I think an important uh, comment to make here is, you know, consolidating your land holding early in a project's history is key. You know, we paid $10 million for 6,000 acres of private land, uh, works out at just over, you know, $1,600 an acre, you know, more recently, companies have been paying over $50,000 an acre and uh, more commonly over $20,000. So, you know, good piece of business. We've got all the land we need, both from an exploration standpoint and development. Uh, turning to our resource, uh, you know, in the space of, of two years, we've put together two mineral resources um, backed up by full geological model technical studies. Now you can see here we've got just over 500 million tons in all categories, um, you know, almost 5 billion pounds of copper, over 5 billion pounds when you incorporate silver and moly. But, um, you know, large percentage, 83% in the M&I category, it's a consequence of, of the historical drilling, you know, over 200,000 meters uh, that have been drilled on the project. And, and that's what de-risked it for me and, and got me involved into the company. And so we've got a combined open pit and underground resource, and that formed the basis for the PEA, which we put out um, a couple of months ago. Um, turning, this is a graphical image of, um, of that resource. We've got two styles of mineralization. We've got uh, breccia hosted, which uh, uh, correlates with the open pit. Um, these breccias have a, a high-grade core over a percent copper, and then a lower-grade uh, mineralized envelope around it. 
and then we have um, and then the underground resource um, is associated with uh, stock work veins in porphyry. You see a number of the pits are limited on data. Those white spaces haven't been drilled. And so we certainly see uh, you know, room for um, resource expansion. And you'll see that um, in some of the drill results coming up. Um, and then we've got a, a large footprint underground and, and additionally these uh, some high-grade cores within the underground resource as well. So turning to the PEA, this is, as I say, a base case. It's really the start of the Faraday journey. It was being able to demonstrate a, a robust project and a, a platform in which to build from as we go forward. So we see a 30,000 ton per day operation, producing an average of just over 50,000 tons of copper annually for 30 years. Sort of around about 10 to 12 years of open pit, transitioning in into 20 years of underground and then um, some uh, low-grade stockpile production. So as I mentioned, that, that low initial capital, just under 800 million to, to get the uh, open pits and, and, um, and the mill, and then uh, ongoing cash flow, repay the capital, and then fund the underground development. So good recoveries. It's a sulfide system. Uh, Charcoal pyrite uh, and bornite are the, are the essential. Uh, sulfide minerals, 94% uh, recovery. Um, uh, at low strip ratio for the pits, uh, 1.2 to 1. We're looking at a, a block cave method for the, for the underground extraction. So here's the mine layout. You can see the open pits sort of decoupled from, from, the, from the underground. We've got two underground footprints in Keel and American Eagle, and they're going to be accessed via a twin decline system. We're going with, uh, I think, uh, dry stack tailings. Uh, I think that's important, particularly in Arizona, when you think about recycling of, of water in the desert and also a smaller environmental footprint. Then post-PEA, uh, we got 10,000 meters of drilling and results that came in. Um, and so this is all not part of the PEA or the MRE. And so, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we saw that the, the open pits were limited on data, so a drill hole here and the copper prints, you know, high-grade high copper starting to intersect massive sulfide zones within the breaches, and also um, precious metal rich as well. And um, previously, if you'd looked at that resource estimate, no gold estimated because previous workers didn't analyze for gold. So we've got a, a project of analyzing for gold and are looking at that gold could form a significant byproduct within the copper concentrate. And so we've got, you know, additionally, you know, here, copper giant, good intersection, uh, you know, over 100 meters at 0 0.785% of that is sitting outside of the, the open pit. So it certainly confirms the, the thesis that we can significantly grow the resource beyond the current MRE. And similarly, you know, within the underground as well, showing that it's, it's open to the west, which then starts to form the narrative on, on the exploration. So when we look at the system, you know, we see this sort of continuum, the most uh, between breccia mineralization transitioning into the porphyry mineralization. And the most complete si mineral system we've got to date is mammoth down to keel, so going from breccia down into the porphyry mineralization. So the breccia bodies over on the left-hand side of the uh, of the map here, um, they haven't been drill tested at depth, so the potential of what happens to these as they go down and, and intersect porphyry mineralization at depth hasn't been tested. And then similarly, when we look above the, uh, the Keel and American Eagle, or particularly the American Eagle porphyry, should I say, the, the stock work of veins there is generally horizontal, so drill holes previously were done vertically, so they didn't test the vertically extensive breccia bodies. So we've matched mapped a whole series of breaches above the American Eagle porphyry and they will be a focus of future drilling as well. And then turning to the, to the district. So I mentioned 200,000 meters of drilling have been done on the project sort of historically, but 95% of it was focused in the mineral resource area. And, and so in the district, it's really untapped. We've got two key structures, uh, one in the, in the east called the Holy Joe Fault, and that is the conduit for all the breaches and porphyries associated with the mineral resource, where you can see we've got a number of targets to the northwest and the southeast that haven't been drill tested. 
and obviously, as I mentioned before, you know, expansion around the immediate resource area as well. And then the Western Fault, which is the conduit to all the breaches and porphyries in the west here, there's been no drill testing at all. So that's an exciting area to be looking at testing going forward. In terms of environmental and, and stakeholder engagement, we're working with the regulators in the US, whether that's ADEQ, um, the flora and fauna people, uh, BLM, etc. in terms of putting a framework together to start that data collection. And so we've been installing flow meters at surface to, to map out the water. We're installing uh, piezometers in our drill holes. We've commenced uh, geochemistry, uh, the sampling of, of the waters, building up that database that will lead into the permitting process. And then we've started both community engagement and having open houses, as well as outreach to all of the native Indian tribes in Arizona, of which nine, there are nine. They've had site visits and they all recognize they have no rights over the project. So turning into the sort of opportunities and next steps, I mentioned that you know, we're targeting an increase in production from the, the base case of 30,000 tonnes per day up to 45 and, and then 75,000 tonnes of copper production. How are we doing that? Well, obviously through, through the drill bits, you know, continuing to look at that resource expansion as well as new discoveries. The value engineering, we're busy with additional metallurgical studies and also looking at grind size. Um, we're still seeing 95% recovery on a 300 micron grind size. So being able to, to go with a coarser grind will help us with that uh, production increase. Um, and then, and as I say, you know, we've got new data sets. We flew a, a detailed airborne geophysical survey, spectral survey. That's all feeding into that targeting um, and, and, and new discoveries. And so we're aiming for sort of a, an updated technical study uh, as we progress into 2025. And so in summary, you know, you know, with the scarcity of resources, you know, it's great now that, that copper's getting onto the critical uh, metals list in, in the US. And, you know, as we come through this current economic crisis, then we're going to have an exciting project ready for development. I think with that, I've got time for, for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Any questions from the floor? Paul, you, uh, you mentioned your PEA is a platform for moving things forward. You plan to increase production. Are there any other obvious cost-saving measures that you plan to try to implement here as you work on the PFS? Um, I mean, one thing we're working on, we've, we've signed an LOI with a solar power company, um, and so they're doing a feasibility study to, to put in a 100 to 150 megawatt solar farm, um, and that obviously that will bring down, um, well, not only will it make it sort of, you know, being able to produce copper with a renewable energy source, but it will bring down, you know, costs of power as well to probably averaging around six and a half cents. I say looking at increasing that, um, that grind size will, will, will help bring down costs as well. And then, you know, targeting bringing in, you know, higher grade material above current resource grade into the open pits as well. And actually, you know, the, the goal, bringing the gold byproduct in. And so what we see is for every year that we, um, in, or add an, an additional year to the open pit life and, we, and, and delay the underground by a year, we add about $100 million to the MPV. And then obviously bringing in the gold into the concentrate as well will add significant value. And it looked like some of that high grade in the breccia was also open up dip, up, up towards surface. Yeah. So that would be in the pit as well as... Yes, exactly. You know, there's still a, obviously a, a lot of, you know, by no means this is the end of the story. As I say, it's the start of the story. Okay, I think we're out of time. Okay. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.